Hello, and welcome to the Pharma Forum Podcast's first episode for 2020. For this one, I met up with Conor McGraw, who is a strategic partnerships lead at at Roche Products in the UK. His current responsibilities include partnering with the NHS to leverage broad scale genomic profiling and meaningful data at scale. So we spent some time talking about big data and patient outcomes. There's an obvious big data strategy at Roche at the moment, not least with its 2018 acquisition of Flatiron Health. And this episode of the podcast examines how the company approaches big data and reveals some results from some of its partnerships to date. You can find more details of this episode, including a download link for the podcast and information about other installments in the series at pharmaforum.com forward slash podcast. The Pharma Forum podcast is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Acast, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, where you can find and subscribe to it by searching for Pharma Forum. So, Connor, welcome to the Pharma Forum podcast. I think uh, before we start talking about uh, around uh, the topic uh, for this episode of big data and personalised health. I wonder if I could ask you to say a few words about yourself to introduce introduce yourself to the listeners. Absolutely. Thanks, Dominic. So, yeah, my name's Conor McGaw. Um, I am part of the strategic partnerships team here at Roche in the UK. And essentially what we are passionate about is build it, working with the NHS in partnership to build personalised healthcare capabilities to ultimately um, lead to better outcomes for patients and, I suppose, um, more sustainable healthcare in a world where um, resource is forever being challenged. Um, so, yeah, really excited to be talking to you today. Mm-hmm. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much for, for, for making the time to, to join us. So, uh, for um, today, we're looking at big data and personalised health. Uh, I'd like to, we'll, we'll come on to some of uh, Roche's really interesting partnerships. I think uh, sounds like you and your colleagues, uh, certainly last year, if not also this year, have been uh, particularly um, busy with some really um, sort of groundbreaking, ambitious uh, partnerships being, being signed in, in this space. But if, if we sort of pull back for a little bit and look at it from an industry-wide perspective, uh, when we think of, of big data in pharma, what sort of data are, are we talking about? Yeah, so... <clears throat> Um, sort of point of clarity, I suppose. Um, a lot of people do refer to it as big data, but what is big? So at Roche, we talk about meaningful data at scale. So it's about having enough data, and I suppose critically, data that's of a high enough quality curated to the right level to actually be um, usable to you know achieve a meaningful outcome. Mm-hmm. Um, they predict that next year um, healthcare data globally will double every 73 days. So you know it's it's exponential growth um, in, in the healthcare space. And uh, what's driving that is um, the general clinical data that all of our doctors capture on us every day whenever they type into their computers, uh, but also the genomic data that's being captured. So a lot of you will be aware of sort of Genomics England and the whole, whole genome sequencing projects, but um, you know in rare disease and in um, in in cancer, um, understanding the genomics underlying the disease is critical in terms of being able to deliver personalised healthcare. And whenever you then layer on top of that imaging data, so if you think about MRI scans and CT scans that are um, forever being generated, also scans of the retina, if we think about ophthalmology, all of that is massive in terms of the volumes of data, and all of that can be really valuable and useful. Uh, in in helping us to understand the biology of the disease of a patient and uh, I suppose ultimately um, striving towards personalised healthcare and better outcomes. Okay, thanks. And that's, that's a really interesting distinction from not necessarily big data, which historically uh, would focus on more sort of, um, messy data sets, mm-hmm. I guess, and makes it its, um, raise and detra to draw together as many different um, massive data sets as possible, whereas there's a slightly more nuanced approach possible perhaps in, in healthcare in terms of um, the data is going to be uh, quite a bit cleaner maybe than, than those sorts of things. Well, it's interesting. I, mean, I suppose we'll probably come on to a little bit about the technology and, and the partnerships. Um, we'd be wrong to think that healthcare data is um, is clean in inverted commas. You know, sure. there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done mm. um, to, to put the data to get the data into the correct format. Mm. And in fact, you know, some people would say that actually data has got zero value um, and that it's whenever it's kind of 
being cleaned up and joined together and you can actually derive insights from it so that meaning that's whenever it becomes becomes valuable and um, the scale piece is interesting because as you i think rightly say big data does sometimes feel like it's just everything thrown into a melting pot um, the meaningful data at scale sort of speaks to what is the use case so if you were looking to improve a pathway in a in a in one single hospital you might need smaller amounts of data and it might need to be created to a lower quality. Whereas if you're looking to um, do a, a virtual control arm for a clinical study, so instead of having your randomized clinical trial with you know, half the patients receiving um, a standard of care, uh, treatment that's already licensed, you're using a virtual control arm, that data needs to be of significant scale and also of really high sort of regulatory quality. So the use case that the data is going to be used for is critical. And that's why at Ross, we quite like the, the, the term meaningful data at scale. Mm -hmm. No, it certainly makes makes sense. And uh, you mentioned, of course, the, the technology, I suppose, to um, start to make sense of, of um, meaningful da data at scale, sorry, big, big data. Uh, where where do, do technologies, do you think, such as um, um, AI or, or machine learning, um, fit into in, into this, be able to make sense of this data? So I think it's fair to say that it's the um, emergence in technology recently that makes um, AI and machine learning so exciting in respect to um, meaningful data at scale. We need large quantities of healthcare data um, for deep learning to be effective. Um, and then whenever we've got that deep learning um, in effect working, we can then start to, to drive artificial intelligence um, from it. Um, I think what uh, Roche sees as the value of uh, AI and machine learning and meaningful data scale is really um, developing an ultra high resolution view um, of individuals and um, the fact that their individual biology of disease is very different. And we need to be able to, um, to, to develop that understanding if we're really going to get to a point where we can deliver personalized healthcare and drive um, improved outcomes for patients in the, the diseases and with the conditions that we're seeking treatments for. Mm. And can, can you give us uh, a, perhaps a, a bit of a flavor in terms of the me types of meaningful data that, you, that you're looking to, to use? I mean, when, we, when we're talking about data uh, within healthcare that, uh, that resonates or that is useful to Roche in this context, what sort of data do we need? So um, I suppose, like previously mentioned, the genomics um, is um, particularly interesting. So Roche has a very long standing heritage in cancer. Um, and, you know, the idea that um, one size fits all in treatment for a particular um, tumour really, really no longer fits. Um, so I think we're very familiar with with something like um, HER2 testing in, in breast cancer, where we start to develop biomarkers, but, but things are going well beyond that now. Um, we're starting to, to see the benefits of identifying what genes um, have mutated, um, what is the specific underlying um, biology of a tumour, and then that uh, genomic profile being used to help select um, treatment options. Um, and in fact, going forward, a lot of experts would say we will no longer treat uh, cancer based on the site of the tumour, but much more on the, the genomics of the tumour. So ge genomics is a, is a critical piece. Um, but another, I think, really exciting area is um, retinal images. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if we look outside of some of the work that Roche has done, we've seen um, Google DeepMind uh, working with Moorfields Hospital, where they've been able to develop um, AI algorithms of uh, looking at retinal scans to really help to um, more quickly and accurately diagnose what the um, the the disease of the eye is, and then that allows the clinicians to get on and um, and apply um, more accurate and more personalised treatments um, for patients. So, you know, at Roche we talk about the omics. It's the genomics. It's the um, it's it's the, it's the phenotypes. It's the the imaging data along with all the traditional pathology 
blood tests and um, histology and obviously you know we'll never move away from the the expert um appraisal of the clinician but it's bringing that all together um and being able to derive as i said sort of new meaning all around the underlying biology of disease mm -hmm. and the Great, great example looking at uh, more, more fields and uh, some of Google's work certainly seems like there's there's an increasing number of uh, almost case studies that one can uh, can um, point to nowadays or, or um, key partnerships being being um, formed we look at maybe 10 years ago the, the standout example might have been Google and the flu trends work and um, mm -hmm. being able to predict the spread of flu based on um, uh, search words that people were inputting into Google search engine um, clearly, things have in, in that space of that uh, the last decade have moved on uh, a, a lot since then. Uh, I was at um, the Frontiers Health uh, Digital in Innovation Conference in Berlin last year, and a lot of the speakers were pointing to a, a number of uh, partnerships signed by Roche uh, uh, in, in last year as uh, evidence of how um, uh, the sector is moving forwards and some of the exciting developments in there. So. I'd, Definitely like to get your, some of your thoughts on on some, uh, some of those uh, uh, developments mm -hmm. with um, strategic partnerships at Roche being clearly a, a key part of your your current role. So could you tell me about some of the recent recent partnerships that uh, Roche has been um, forming in this, yeah, this area? Absolutely, I think that um, that. At Roche, we see ourselves in quite a unique position um, in in the healthcare um, sector. Um, sort of the, the constellation of diagnostics, um, pharmaceutical medicine, and technology all coming together to allow us not only to follow the science but to follow the technology and the data as well. We see that that as sort of being critical components of really delivering um, personalised healthcare for the future. So there's been a couple of um, I suppose quite high profile um, acquisitions by Roche in the past two years. Um, firstly uh, was Foundation Medicine who um, is a genomic profiling um, company based out in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts who uh, specialise in oncology. And so, you know, it's critical if we're going to treat patients um, cancer based on based on the the mutations that have occurred based on that genomic profile that, you know, we understand exactly what has happened with the cancer. Um, and so Foundation Medicine are leading experts in that that space. They are an independent organisation and, um, you know, we, we work with them closely in the UK to bring genomic profiling um, to patients who are uh, being treated for and looking for treatments um, for, for cancer. Um, another acquisition um, was of Flatiron Health, mm -hmm. which again um, is oncology um, specific um and again i think this uh, this speaks to roche's um heritage and and legacy in in the space of cancer and uh, Flatiron Health um, are uh, an outfit that um, work with oncology data and they, they curate data to a regulatory grade and have um, partnerships themselves with the likes of the FDA, where they are actually um, looking at what happens in the real world um, whenever cancer treatments are, are given. They're actually able to recreate um, clinical trial um, control arms and compare what was achieved in a clinical study with what's achieved in the real world. And th they work across um, all life science companies in no way are they sort of unique to Roche and mm -hmm. you know you know it's important that I do stress that they are independent um from us in terms of how they operate um but what's really um fascinating and exciting for the future is we see um an overlap of um the Kaplan Meyer curves um from an RCT and the virtual control arms that Flatiron have created and it does speak to potentially in the future the possibility of clinical trials being done with virtual control arms rather than active control arms mm -hmm. which actually could help accelerate um the speed at which patients get access to new and innovative medicines which would be really exciting for everybody and help um, drive outcomes.
in addition to um, to those companies that we've acquired and, and, and work in partnership, Roche is also um, partnered with a number of different organisations, um, be it um, other organisations that curate data, be it um, technology providers that perhaps provide wearables to track patients' um, ongoing background um, well-being, or be it um, companies that... Um, take data and then use it to help inform clinicians decisions in terms of clinical decision support. So Roche very much sees the need to develop capability internally, but also partner with the amazing talent that's out there in the tech companies, uh, because ultimately what we're all trying to do is work together to, to leverage the data that exists um, so that we can derive meaning from it and um, improve patient outcomes. Mm -hmm. And looking at some of those, those, those strategic partnerships, and it certainly sounds like you and your, your colleagues have been uh, exceptionally busy in, in the last, <laughs> last couple of years in this, this respect. Um, can you tell me a bit about how they're progressing or uh, are any of them at, at, at a stage where you can share, share some results on um, the kind of work that you've, you've been doing with them? Yeah, I mean, I think as you'd probably understand, some of them are commercially sensitive. Um, sure. But we were uh, really excited to see um, HDR UK, which is, you know, a um, an organization with sort of governmental backing here in the UK, um, announce their digital innovation hubs uh, back at the start of September and that Roche um, was successful in being part of one of the digital innovation hubs in ophthalmology along with Murfield Hospital. So that is the Insight program and is, uh, I suppose, striving to uh, bring personalized medicine medicine to ophthalmology across the whole of the UK. Um, so that's that's a really exciting one that um, sort of has had announcements in the public domain. Um, another one that um, that the UK team is is heavily involved in is our uh, precision cancer partnership with the Christie Hospital up in Manchester. So the Christie is sort of Europe's biggest single site cancer hospital. They are global leaders in terms of how they how they treat um, cancer, and um, but. Despite their their leadership and their expertise, um, they identify as do we that um, for the more rare cancers, um, outcomes lag behind um, the more common cancers. So, we um, announced in December last year as part of the Office of Life Science um, sector deals that we are in partnership with them. Um, we are working with them to bring um, sort of genomic profiling to scale. Um, so, how can can many more patients than would traditionally be done have their genomic profile for their cancer um, created? And then how can we take that information and um, curate it to a, a very high standard? Um, as with any partnership, there should be benefits on both sides. And it's really clear uh, our key that we're clear on what those um, benefits are um, for each other. Um, so the Christie, um, they, they are striving to be a leader in sort of digital research and uh, with a specific focus, I think, around, around the rare cancers. Um, and that allows them to be a global leader in terms of um, providing uh, real world data insights to the life science industry. It makes them a very strong partner for, for the life science industry around uh, hypothesis generation for clinical trials, uh, but also it, it probably strengthens their position to, um, to be a leading clinical trial site. For Roche, um, we're really keen on using the partnership to design better pathways for patients so that they're um, getting, I suppose, more effective, more sustainable um, treatment for their cancer, be that a rare cancer or be that a more common cancer. But we're also um, keen to generate data that perhaps one day can be used by, um, by the payers or the regulators um, in the UK to, to change um, the way they view medicine the way they'll um, they'll reimburse a medicine based on perhaps the genomic profile. And obviously, it's critical that you actually generate data and understand, you know, is a personalised healthcare approach um, delivering um, better outcomes in the real world? So that's something that's ongoing. Um, you know, it, we move at pace um, and, um, you know, each side of the partnership brings their own um, skills and capabilities and expertise to it. Um, and it's, uh, it's fantastic to be working with the NHS to, I suppose, 
better position the UK um, as a centre of excellence in, um, in research and development um, going forward. Uh, dare I mention the Brexit word, and uh, you know, make, making sure that uh, you know the UK is competitive in that space. So, so we're, we're um, really hugely enjoying that work there, mm -hmm. and certainly plays to what you're saying. I think around um, ensuring that data is meaningful for for both yourselves, payers, regulators, and, and ultimately patients. I think that's a, a really important point, and um, you know, the the use cases as we would refer to it, um, you know, needs to be needs to be very clear um, within any partnership. You know, what are we actually seeking to do? Are we doing things for the right reason? And you know, ultimately, is it about um, improving outcomes? Um, we believe it's about improving outcomes through personalised health. So, as I've said, it's no longer one size fits all, but it's really bringing all of those different types of data together um, so that we can have a meaningful impact um, uh, for, for patients' health. Okay. And as, as um, yourselves and uh, other companies across the pharmaceutical industry and the life sciences sector work towards uh, producing um, uh, meaningful data and having that, that to work with, I wonder what sort of challenges you, you're facing at the moment. I, I suppose thinking particularly about around sort of primarily maybe privacy concerns, the tech sector to some extent doesn't necessarily have the best reputation in terms of privacy concerns uh, at, at, at the moment. What sort of concerns potentially might patients, healthcare professionals, or even health systems have um, over the use of, of healthcare data within this, this realm? Yeah, so I, I think it's probably worth pointing out that the the pharmaceutical industry has many decades of experience um, handling patient data um, and, and protecting that data in an appropriate way. If you think that um, our, our industry is probably the leader in um, uh, running clinical trials and obviously they're all done to an extremely high standard with data being um, appropriately handled and, and um, patient privacy being uh, respected and, and, and protected. Um, at Roche we very much see it as a privilege to um, to, to work with patient data and very much see the need for uh, respecting and ensuring protection um, of that data. And obviously there's a number of um, laws, protocols and principles in place to ensure that happens. So when we're working um, in partnerships, actually one of the areas where we find the NHS has a lot of really strong experience. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's an area that we, uh, that, that they bring um, strength to, to our partnerships and our collaboration on is you know making sure that Caldecott principles are adhered to, making sure that um, ethics um, panels are engaged with, um, and you know where, where necessary the information commissioner's office is, uh, is engaged as well. So you know we are committed um, very much to um, uh, ensuring um, patient protection. Uh, privacy. Um, we think that the NHS is as well, and it's about making sure that everything's done to the high, highest level of standards and not sort of the, the bare minimum. I suppose the one thing I'd probably add is that um, we think that it's really important that patients, uh, that we're very transparent, that patients understand um, the goals of what we're um, looking to do. So they're, they're informed of where data is being accessed and, and why it's being accessed. Um, and that ultimately um, there's agreement that it's around trying to understand and, and improve healthcare. And what we do find when we um, engage uh, patient groups, be it through uh, input um, panels, etc., that when patients um, understand the, the, the goals and the principles, they um, are open to data being used if it's handled appropriately um, and that the reassurances are made. So there's there's an educational piece to be done and, um, and we are very much on that journey um, with our partners here in the UK to engage um, and involve patients in um, how we do things, but also to make sure that there's education around the programmes that we do so that, um, you know, so there's a, a clear understanding of the goals. Mm -hmm. And as, as Roche and the, the wider pharmaceutical industry um, progresses on its, its, its big, big data journey, if, if we can call, yeah. call it that, um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts around the types of skills 
that the industry needs. So maybe this is where part, the, a partnership approach is, is, is needed. I'm particularly thinking uh, there's been such a such an explosion in in big data um, in, and in terms of the uh, variety of sectors looking to use these approaches. Yeah. That there must be people with with those the right sort of skills must be in in high demand. Um, does pharma face a skills gap in this respect, or is that where the partnership approach comes into play? So I think it's where partnership approach comes into play. I think we should never underestimate the value of the skill that sits within academia. Um, so, you know, if we think about data science, I mean, here at Roche, um, you know, in this building, we have a lot of data science capability. And those guys' um, skills have been honed around clinical trials. So that, that, that capability can be applied to other areas of data science. And, you know, we're increasingly building capabilities around data science in real world data. So data that's being collected from the clinics rather than in clinical trials. But how do we um, harness, um, access, collect new types of data? Uh, you know, everybody's very excited about wearables. Um, you know, is, um, is wearable data a usable, meaningful data? Is it, um, is it junk data? There's a lot of tech companies out there um, working on that. So depending on the specific capability we're thinking about, there's either, um, you know, there's capability that we can bring um, to the partnerships. There's capability that we can bring in through academia or, you know, in the UK um, from the NHS, or there's bringing um, technology companies um, along with us. We certainly... Um, at Roche, where possible, we'll look to partner externally with technology companies. Um, if you think about the the agile approach that a lot of those technology companies um, bring, uh, the user focused design that they that they apply, that's their level of expertise. You know, our our expertise historically is the development of medicines, um, and so you know we want to continue to bring our expertise to the table, and we want to bring in other people's expertise so that um, you know so that we're we're rapid in um, in realizing this vision around improved outcomes for patients, um, and that we don't uh, stagnate whilst we build capability in house. Sure. I suppose so it's a blend. I suppose there's a question of, of culture there as well. You you want the um, innovative tech companies to retain um, the kind of culture that made them innovative and made them leaders without having to fit them into a, 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 a fit a, a round peg into a square hole and say, well, you must, you have to follow our way of doing things. You have to um, follow the follow the the Roche way, the farmer way, whatever that that might be. I think that's a fantastic point, Dominic, and. It underpins um, in large why companies like Foundation Medicine and Flatiron need to be allowed to operate independently, uh, despite them now being under the ownership of the Roche Group. Um, so yeah, that that agility, that um, that 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 mentality that sits within perhaps a startup organisation is critical. Um, but then the other piece is, you know, we are not um, operating. Uh, we are not. Um, collecting, curating, and using data purely for the benefit of Roche. It's for the benefit of healthcare. And so lots of manufacturers of medicines are involved in that. And so, again, that independence is critical if all manufacturers of medicines are going to be able to engage with those organisations to deliver better outcomes for, for our patients, which is what you know we are all about. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, to, to um, sum things up for, for this episode of the Pharma Forum podcast, um, I want you to tell me, how do you see meaningful data ultimately leading to better patient outcomes? Absolutely. I'd be happy to, Dominic. So, you know, at the starting point, it's um, about really um, having that ultra um, high definition view of the, the biology underpinning the disease. So it's around collecting much more detailed data at that diagnostic stage of the disease. It's around then, um, I suppose, consolidating that data and making sure that the clinicians treating patients are able to make the right decision about the, the right medicine for the right patient at the right time. Um, there's then a, a coming together of the traditional um, 
cycle of medicine, medicine development um, and that um, that real world data clinical view that a clinician um, looks at so that so that we are um, better equipped to develop appropriate medicines and that um, when we're de developing appropriate medicines and bringing them to market, the, the data the clinician looks at is being presented in a meaningful way to help them make those decisions. Um, and then the closing of the loop is when the, when the most appropriate medicine is being selected, the patient's um, treatment um, outcomes are being um, aggregated into the data set as well. So we can work out is is the best possible outcome really being achieved? Um, so we talk about fast learning systems. So you know, can the um, can the clinician make rapid decisions, perhaps change therapy if they're not quite seeing the response that they um, that they might have anticipated, or in fact, new data is coming in in the background to help inform a, a different choice. And so all of that is around meaningful data at scale um, being um, being processed appropriately and technology helping to drive medicine development, um, diagnostics and treatment decisions, and then also the, the feedback as to are the outcomes that were expected being achieved. Um, but ultimately, we do believe that uh, it's about individualised uh, patient care and better and more sustainable outcomes for, for patients and for the healthcare systems in which we work. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that kind of that brings us to the end of this episode. So thank you very much for joining me for the Pharma Forum podcast. Thank you, Dominic. And that's it for episode 17 of the Pharma Forum podcast and my chat with the Roches, Conor McGaw on big data and patient outcomes. You can find more details of this episode, including a download link for the podcast and information on other installments in the series at pharmaforum.com forward slash podcast. The podcast is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Acast, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, where you can find and subscribe to it by searching for Pharma Forum. And don't forget to visit our website to sign up for daily or weekly email pharmaceutical news and analysis bulletins, and follow us on Twitter, where we are at Pharma Forum.